Yeah, so we'll talk, I'll tell you guys later, but okay. big day for Maisie here. And uh, morning, everyone who is uh, getting into the Zoom room right now. Thanks for being here. We're just going to get started in a couple couple minutes. All right, we can probably get going here. BJ, you want to start okay. us off? Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, good to be back together again. Um, for new folks, welcome. Old folks, welcome back. Um, I'll just say that real quick, kind of, you know, up front for new folks, the way these work. Um, we're going to go through some slides and kind of lay out some themes, um, but then the, then it's the fun part is the Q and A and discussion and us just talking things out. And really, we really mean it. This is um, pretty much anything and everything is welcome. Safe place to think and feel just about anything within the boundaries of basic respect and kindness. Um, and so, and of course, you don't feel like you have to say anything either. Um, silence is fine too. Um, but with that, let me introduce uh, Howard Spear, our guest today, who's going to be presenting with me, or I'll be presenting with him is probably a better way to say it. Howard and I go back a while now, um, have worked together through metal uh, for a couple of years. And it's been my great joy to be with Howard, moving through all sorts of things. Howard's a... Uh, I'll let him tell him tell you guys a little bit about himself, but he's a hardcore Jersey litigator who's done many things in his life, and uh, and I just it's a joy to get to know you, Howard. Um, so, but before we cut to you, buddy, let me. Um, well, actually, no, jump in here. Look, anything else you want the ga the gang to know about you, your situation, Howard? Uh, well, I'm um, 66 years old, got multiple sclerosis, um, it's now rendered me quadriplegic, I can't move at all, um, diagnosed about 26 years ago, before that I, I engaged in a lot of extreme sports, I was very physically active, I was a litigator, so I was used to being on my feet, traveling a lot, and over time I just kind of watched my body go south on me. And, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to offer this talk was there's a lot of things I learned along the way that I think can be helpful to a lot of people that I wished I'd known over the course of the 26 years. Amen. Right on, Howard. Well, okay. Well, thank you and welcome. Um, so we'll jump in here, but first go back over to Sonia for some more housekeeping stuff. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, just want to go through how you can interact with Howard and BJ after they've gone through um, the slides and kind of the topics that they wanna cover. So you can raise your hand and we will unmute you and you can speak with Howard and BJ and ask your question that way. Or if you'd prefer not to do that, you can just type it into the Q&A and I will read it aloud for you. So again, you can raise your hand, you can type it in um, whatever feels best for you. And heads up that the chat is also available if you want to just put a note or a thought in there as well. Thanks for being here. Okay. Thank you, Sons. All right, Howard. Well, let's jump in together, buddy. Um, okay, great. Um, yeah, one of the things that I think has been incredibly helpful for me and something I learned as a litigator and um, I, I've been involved in a lot of men's work. I created an organization for men a while ago. And one of the things that I came to, to realize, the importance of, of perspective in understanding where you are, where you wanna go, what's really in the way of, of you getting to where you wanna go. And the, the analogy I like to use is if you think back to when you were a kid and you either had a dollhouse or your little toy soldiers, 
and you always kind of knew where to put, you know, the the coffee table and the couch or or the horses and the tanks, because you were you were stepping back from the overall picture. And you can look down on what was going on and understand where everything fit and how it all interacted with each other. And you know, life is kind of like the same way. And I found oftentimes when I kind of get stuck in my own head, the easiest thing for me to do is kind of pull back a little bit and do what I like to call going to the balcony, mm -hmm. kind of get up on the balcony, looking down on my life and getting a sense of this is where you are, this is where you want to go. And somebody told me a story about something that samurai used to do, mm -hmm. you know, before they went into battle. And they would kind of do the same thing. They'd look down and say that this is a man who's afraid. What should that warrior do? And it would give them a sense of how to approach what they were about to engage in. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, oftentimes when I get a little mixed up, I kind of pull myself back and look at everything and kind of look at where I am, get a sense of where I want to go, um, evaluate what resources are available to me, um, and then just you know, make a commitment to try to move forward, you know, without really being invested in what the outcome is. But as long as I have a sense of where I'm headed, it kind of makes it easier to get there instead of, you know, having all these voices talking to me and, and you know, telling me, go this way, go that way, and just getting so hung up in, in the dissonance. Hey, Amen. Well, Howard, do you, and is this where your perseverance and doggedness help? Like, you know, as you say, sort of getting a sense of where you want to go and setting out in that direction and how you handle the invariably the things that come along and want to throw you off course or your point of view might shift or how do you find the balance between when to persevere and keep heading where you want to head and, and then versus kind of re, reboot, ch check the path and see what you actually have control over? Yeah, it's really with that perspective thing. It's, it's by stepping back and you can, you can realize in the overall scheme of things, you know, the thing that might have you rattled in the moment mm. is not important to the, to the bigger picture. You know, and, and that kind of takes us to the next slide, yeah. which is, is kind of, you know, the importance of, of really in your decision making, being able to figure out the difference between the voices you hear from other people and, and really what's important to you. You know, what I, what I find a lot with myself is when I say things like, I need to, it's usually because somebody's voice is telling me this is something I should be doing. <laughs> and, and it's not until I can say I want to do something and kind of really feel ownership in it that I understand this is what I want. You know, um, and so the whole process here, when you know, when you when you're faced with a disability or a chronic illness, everybody's got their their miracle solution. Mm -hmm. And I know when I first was diagnosed, Every day I was getting, you know, emails from friends with articles about somebody who, you know, couldn't walk and then miraculously they were running marathons again. Or, you know, just all this stuff that you read and you think, yeah. if I can't do that, it must be because it must be because I'm not trying hard enough. And, you know, the other thing I found with doctors, you know, doctors have their specialties and they they know what they want to accomplish but they tend not to be looking at the big picture. Um, you know, for a really long time, I was on uh, you know, medicine that was supposed to slow down the degeneration of, of my, my body. But the problem was it was bogging up my mind and making me feel really lethargic. And as a lawyer, you know, my mind is everything. Mm -hmm. And so on the one hand, I had to weigh you know, the pluses and minuses between slowing down the illness, which I think was going to be inevitable, or just being at my best as a lawyer. And I made the decision that I'd give up the slowing down the degeneration for, for the opportunity to just be sharp and be on top of my game. Hmm. You know, Howard, I'm going to step out real quick. It's amazing. My 
my girls having a moment. Okay. So can I hand it over to you and Howard for a sec here? Yeah, of course, of course. Sure. Oops. No, that, no that, that's a good place to go. go, go to oh, yeah? Practice. Okay. Because that's part yeah. of, part of practicing acceptance is like when your co-host tells you he has to leave the room to be able to just kind of say, okay, it's in your lap, run with it. Um, and, and, you know, and again, I, I think the practicing acceptance became really important because part of accepting that my body was degenerating and that there were decisions I was making that was actually, you know, not slowing down the degeneration was the ultimate acceptance of just, this is going to get bad. Um, and, you know, recently I watched the, uh, the documentary by Michael J. Fox still, um, and the way he reacted when he was diagnosed with Parkinson was kind of similar to the way I reacted when I was diagnosed with MS. Um, I had a really hard time accepting the reality that my body was going south on me. Um, and when I would go into meetings, I always made sure I was the first one in the conference room so nobody would see me limp in. And I'd always wait until everybody left so nobody would see me limp out. Um, and I always had excuses if somebody you know saw me limping and was like, oh, I pulled the muscle. And I, it was really, really hard for me to kind of open up to people and say, you know what, I've got this illness and it's starting to you know, impact my ability to do things. Because in my head, you know, I thought that was a sign of weakness. And if people knew I was, uh, you know, I was sick, they'd be looking at me differently. Um, the great surprise I had is when I actually opened up to uh, my supervisors and told them what was going on. You know, I was lucky I was working for a Fortune 100 company. And for them, um, it kind of helped them metrics to have somebody who had a, a disability on payroll. So they kind of bent over backwards to accommodate me every way possible. Um, and also, you know, by kind of accepting the fact that my body was changing on me and there were things, you know, needed to be different. It gave me the opportunity, I think, to go a little easier on myself, you know, because in, in the past, I was finding that I was really pushing myself extra hard because I didn't want people to see the vulnerability. I didn't want them to see that I wasn't the Howard I was when I was 25, 30 years old. I mean, the reality is we all get older and our bodies change on us anyhow. But for some reason, I felt like I had to fight extra hard to keep that from happening. Um, one of the other things that came from just you know, realizing that things were going to go south on me was I kind of had the freedom to be who I wanted to be. Um, a lot of the way I think about the world and myself these days, you know, comes from movies that I've seen. Um, I've kind of, I've kind of uh, signed up for the Criterion Channel, which is a great streaming service that got access to, you know, movies from around the world. And um, recently, I saw a movie from Sudan, which is, is not a, a, a big originator of motion pictures, but it was a fascinating movie called You Will Die When You're 20. And it's about um, this mother who has a newborn baby and in the Sudan, they bring their, their babies to the, the sheik to get blessed and you know, tell them the future of the child. And when they did this, the sheik told the woman that her child was going to die at the age of 20. And it affected the entire family. The father wound up leaving the family because he couldn't deal with the discomfort of knowing his child was going to die at 20. The mother spent all of the next 20 years literally marking the days until his 20th birthday. And this kid was living for his death until an outsider came by and said, you're out of your mind. If I knew I was gonna die at 20, I'd be living my fullest life until the, my, I turned 20. And then when I was 20 and one day, I'd look at all the people who were telling me I was about to die 
and just laugh at them. And, you know, I, I kind of took on the same mantle, but it's, you know, knowing that things are going south and I wasn't going to be able to do the things I used to do, I think kind of instilled in me a passion to really push myself harder and, you know, just live my best life based on what was available to me. Um, which kind of brings us, I guess, to the next slide. So Howard, here's the fun part. Um, I don't have access to move the slides forward, but I am wondering <laughs> if on the topic of acceptance, um, you can talk a little bit more about, you know, what it was to bring this up in the workplace. That's one of the things that I think we end up talking about a lot is having, um, you know, health changes uh, be discussed and revealed within that space. And, um, you know, was there a moment that you kind of said, I, I want to share this, I am over trying to hide this or make it something that I'm kind of excusing? Was there a, a moment that just shifted your thinking on that? Yeah. Um, and it was funny because the, it'd be great to say everybody's reaction was wonderful and supportive, but um, you still bump into people who are kind of ill-informed and quite frankly, idiots. Um, you know, like a, a lot of people, the first thing out of their mouth is, is it contagious? Um, and once you get past that, I think there's a, a willingness to just kind of accept, you know, um, what's going on. I, I think the thing that surprised me was just how supportive people were. And, and quite frankly, they were kind of in awe because I just kept showing up. Um, my neurologist actually used to tell me all the time that I should have gone on disability you know, a lot earlier than I ultimately did. And I think a lot of the people that I was working with were just impressed by the fact that I was willing to show up at work. And for a lot of them, I think my willingness to just show up was kind of inspiration for them to, if this guy can deal with what he's going through, I've got no reason to complain about anything I'm facing. I, I was kind of like the good luck charm for everybody. Um, and how did that feel to you? Well, you know, initially the challenge was, and that kind of brings the other slide, which you can't see around the motions, because, you know, what, yeah, what we, sorry, Howard, to your point, sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say, we can just, you know, we can go into the next topic. Um, no, 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 no. Yeah, that, if you, that, <laughs> if you no, want. No. That, that's what I was going to talk about is, you know, the, the challenge for me is you, you kind of feel when everybody's telling you they're inspired by the way you show up, you kind of feel like you have to have a happy face all the time. Mm. And, um, you know, one of my problems in life is that I'm almost always happy. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand why, but for whatever reason, I've always kind of had a positive outlook. I've always kind of looked at the, you know, the world as, you know, a glass half full. And um, I was always excited to just kind of be wherever I was and take on the challenges. And um, the challenge for me, in, in the face of everybody looking at me, you know, for inspiration, was realizing that every once in a while, when I had a bad day, it was okay for me to acknowledge that I had a bad day. Um, and when I needed help, and believe me, the, the asking for help was probably the biggest challenge for me because I never asked for help. I can never ask for help. I was one of these guys who, if you asked him a question, especially as a lawyer, if you asked me a question, even if I didn't know the answer, I'd make something up because I don't want to be seen as somebody who didn't know. So the notion of having to ask people for help because I couldn't do things was really, really challenging for me. But I learned to begin to accept help for people and to do it gracefully. Um, and what I came to realize was I was actually giving these people a gift because a lot of people, you know, they, they would just feel good about themselves. They'd feel good about me being able to accept their kindness and, you know, their help. 
in whatever way they could. Um, sometimes things would be a little clumsy, but you know, people still had the ability to kind of give me the best they could. And they were just happy for me being able to accept it gracefully. Um, yeah, I, I understand that sentiment. I am also someone who has to practice asking for help. It is a muscle for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's an incredible muscle. And it's, you know, going back to movies, um, I, I saw this movie called The um, Diving Bell and the Butterfly about the editor of Elle magazine, uh, Jean Dominique Bobby who um, was out driving his Porsche, had a stroke, and as a result, completely paralyzed, except for his, his eyes. The only way he could communicate was to blink. And what this guy decided to do, you know, he'd spent his entire life surrounded by these beautiful women, and now he couldn't do anything at all except blink. And he set out to write a book. And the movie is about the whole process of him writing the book and it gives you a, a chance to kind of get into his mind and the way he viewed his situation. And, you know, I remember watching that and at the end of watching it, I just broke down and cried and cried for about five minutes, went to my bathroom, fell on the floor, hysterical in tears. And after about five minutes, I started laughing because what I realized was for the longest period of time, I kind of felt broken because I hadn't gotten to that point of realizing that there was part of me that should be mourning all the loss that I'd been experiencing. And there was part of me that should have been a little bit afraid for you know, what was coming down the pike. But in that moment, watching that movie, it just kind of tapped all those emotions into me, opened it up, and I was just happy that they were there because up until that point in time, I was so used to putting on the happy face and being Mr. Tough Guy and being unflappable that in that moment of privacy with myself, I, I got this gift of just, you know, having all the emotions come front and center and just letting them in. It was great. Oh. And, you know, we can, I, I realize everyone that we're not able to advance the slides, but I can just, you know, go into what the topic of the next slide is. And this might be a perfect transition, Howard, is emotions having their own, oh, magic, yeah. emotions oh. having their own timetable. Yeah. And, and again, that, that's, that, I think that was the big thing I learned about that was rather than, you know, for the longest time, people were saying to me, you must be in denial. How can you possibly continue to be so happy and positive? And I, I had no explanation for it, except, you know, I, I didn't feel sad. I didn't feel anxious. Um, but, you know, in that moment, when I got hit that way in the movie, it, it just, you know, it made me realize that stuff's going to come to me when it comes to me. You know, um, and, and talking about movies again, you know, I, I saw you know, the movie Inside Out, the Pixar animated film, you know, which does this wonderful job of explaining how all these emotions are running around behind the scenes and, you know, how happiness tends to be this tyrant that always feels like it's got to snuff out the other emotions. And, you know, what I've learned is to just allow the emotions to kind of come in, rear their head when they do, and as long as I kind of acknowledge the, that they're there and again, taking the perspective to step back and, you know, ask myself, you know, why is, why am I feeling this way right now? And understanding it and being able to talk about it, it, it just seems so much more natural. Guys, I'll jump in here. Appreciate your patience with our home situation right now i'm sorry for the interruption um but maybe i can jump in sonia please keep on keeping on in here um i just want to pick up where you're talking there howard how i think you just said as much but a corollary that i feel all the time as i 
I'm tended to feel bad for my emotions. Like if I'm angry, I'll get angry at myself for being angry or, you know, there's a secondary thing. I'll get um, annoyed or ashamed of my own emotions. But I think what you're also pointing to here is that emotions have a mind of their own. It's not like we get to say how we want to feel. I mean, it's really more accurate. I think that emotions are something we observe in ourselves versus something that we dictate. And I still have to remind myself that every day so I don't find myself feeling bad for feeling bad or something like that. Does that resonate with you? Yeah. And again, you know, it goes back to the whole perspective thing. When I'm, when I'm feeling a certain way, if I can pull back and understand why I'm feeling that way, you know, it, it gives me the ability to just say, okay, this is what happened. It's not going to go on forever. You know, I still want to get over here somewhere. So let me just let this thing do what it's got to do. And whenever I'm ready, I'll kind of get back in the boat and sail down the river, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that I really got from watching the Michael J. Fox documentary was an appreciation that, you know, the people in my life have to struggle with trying to guess with how I feel and what I'm able to do and not able to do. And that's gonna be really hard for them. Like, I know how I feel. I know what I can do. I know what I can't do. But for people in my life, you know, for my wife, Dory, you know, it makes her crazy because, you know, she's always worried that I'm not being taken care of, but I'm totally comfortable with where I am. Everything's fine. And unless I tell her that, she doesn't know. She's trying to guess. You know, and I found one of the, the great areas of discomfort for people who are around me is they're so concerned that I'm uncomfortable, you know, physically or emotionally. And unless I tell them otherwise, they just assume the worst. Like I'm always blown away when I haven't seen somebody in a really long time and we'll get together face to face. I would say nine out of 10 times, the first thing they say is you look really good. Like in their head, they kind of build the story up that me being sick, I must be getting decrepit. I must have this sour face on, you know, and, and they see me and they're like, wait a second, you look, you look like I remember you 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, nothing's really changed. And, you know, again, unless I'm telling people that, they tend to make up their own story. Right on. And I guess what you're pointing to here is like, yes, it's on us to let ourselves sort of get out of the way of our emotions in a way, let them come, let them go, like you're saying too. But I suppose it also means that we, we, we grant that to others. People are going to have their thoughts and feelings around us and what our bodies provoke in them too. And to some degree, that's got to be okay too. I suppose... Uh, or does that ever, in your experience, Howard, does it ever get a little bit much, the projections of others that you have to, I don't know, how, well, how do you deal with all the projections of others? I've kind of given myself the freedom mm -hmm. to say, do whatever I want, <laughs> because what I've really come to discover is no one gets angry at the guy in the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Like, I can say anything <laughs> to anybody. And as much as it might piss them off, they kind of, they kind of, you know, write it off as uh, it's just how it being a little cranky. <laughs> like, like Dory sometimes kind of gets blown away how a lot of her friends will be nicer to me than they are to their own husbands. <laughs> because, you know, it's like, uh, poor guy in the wheelchair. Let's mm -hmm. give him a little love. You know, but if the husband says the same thing I said, you know, they, they're they sleeping on the couch. But I can get away with murder because I'm the guy in the wheelchair. And in their head, they think they're supposed to feel sorry for me. So it, it kind of gives me a free pass to do whatever I want to do. Well, that too, like your mind, like, you know, you got your work, you work it. Like you work, this is your reality. These are the details you are, you know, the projections of others, sometimes are new, no, annoying, but sometimes it's something to work in there too. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I I feel a real solidarity with you there. Like earlier on for myself in a version of what you're describing, 
I think I would have felt, I don't know. I didn't let myself fully play with the full suite of my reality, but sometimes that includes playing off the pity of others or whatever else, or letting that, letting the projections of others free you up as you're saying, and there's no shame in that. That actually seems very savvy. Um, yeah. I, I remember after my injuries, I got, went through a long period of wanting to just play with how I appeared to people and just get really kind of playful with it, but a little bit provocative with it. And I would wear outlandish things and do goofy things with my hair. And it was sort of like, because I was sort of wanting to play with this free reign I had, just like you're saying, and that was a way for me to get into my situation, not just tolerate it or deal with it or something. Does that register with you? Are there times where you actually kind of get into it a little? Uh, it, it's a wonderful gift to get a free pass. You yeah. kind of try anything outrageous. Because again, I, you know, my, what I say to people is I'm dying. So, it, it, you know, I, I, I realize that, you know, what I have is going to be limited. So I don't care how people feel about me anymore. Hmm. Be, because, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not my guilt. It's their guilt. They're feeling guilty, you know, that, that somehow they can walk and I can't. Mm -hmm. you know? And again, they, they kind of give me the freedom to be who I want to be because I think for them, it, it's kind of inspiring. It's like, wow, you know, if I want to try that on for one day of not caring what people think, look what I can do. Yeah. Right on. Well, and you, and you make the choice to take that freedom and I watch you play with it and work it. Oh, I, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Right on. Well, should I move us uh, the slides forward here, my friend? Yeah, I think there's one more left, right? Yep. Is a big one. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I, I, I'll be honest, just doing this talk, you know, made me come to terms with the reality of, at some level, my life sucks. Mm. Yeah. Um, thinking back on on the reality that um, you know there's a lot I can't do that I used to be able to do mm -hmm. um, and even though I kind of have the strength and resolve to kind of smile through it and push through it you know the reality is I couldn't get on this you know zoom telecast without somebody pushing buttons for me um and, you know, as much as I want to be, you know, flippant and not care what people think, I still need to enroll other people into playing my game of life. Mm -hmm. Like if I can't keep them engaged in the excitement of taking my adventure with me, then I'm going to be stuck in a corner, you know, all by myself. Mm -hmm. So it makes it real important for me to have to listen to people read the signals, understand where maybe I'm, I'm, I'm pushing things a little bit too hard. Mm. Um, and, you know, sometimes ratchet things back because I'm at the mercy of others. Yeah. How long would you say, I mean, I suppose it's probably a work in progress, but that's just, you know, that's a, I really appreciate you sharing this, that statement or that reality. That's part of this mix. And I'm thinking about like you and Dory. I know com communication is an ongoing work in progress, I suppose, all the time. But, you know, as you look back over your and Dory's relationship, uh, is it, I'm assuming you've both changed over the years. Around, <laughs> yeah. Is that a fair <laughs> statement? Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dory likes to tell me we basically lived about five different lives together. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, between having a daughter, between living in New York City, and then moving out to, you know, the middle of nowhere in the country, um, to just the whole illness thing. Mm. You know, like one of the biggest challenges, and, and you know, I think one of the, if, if there was any, if if there was anything that I really wish I had full perspective of. It was the impact 
my illness would have on my relationship with Dory. Mm -hmm. Because I think we made the mistake of allowing her to kind of take on the, the mantle of caregiver instead of lover mm -hmm. and, and spouse. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's really only been in the last few years that I, I, you know, we've been adamant about getting people in here to take care of me so that's not her, her problem or concern anymore. Mm. <laughs> and she's laughing because as much as we try, it's still her problem and concern. But, um, you know, it, it's made a big difference in our relationship trying to take a lot of that stress away from her. Mm. Uh, because again, like I said, the people who are in your life they want to help you. They want to be there for you. And they don't understand what it is that you need. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of times you don't really understand what you need. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you feel like, you know, do you communicate differently or better now than you did before the accident? I'm assuming I know the answer to that. But, you know, you, as a litigator, you're a communicator of sorts. But maybe I'm looking at Dory, but then she's looking back at me because she wants to see if I get the answer right. Uh, <laughs> I I think I do better than I did originally. Um, it's still a work in progress. Yeah. Um, I mean, because I came into the relationship with an incredible amount of arrogance, mm. and I'm a guy. And one thing I've learned is is men tend not to listen. Mm. And um, you know, again, like, like I said, as a lawyer, I kind of felt like I always had the answer. And what I came to realize was most of the time when we talked, she wasn't looking to me for answers. She was just looking for me to actually hear what mm -hmm. she was saying. Um, and, you know, part of the frustration when you can't move is sometimes I have to sit there and listen. And um, even when I don't want to, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So it's been both humbling and liberating in a way too. It sounds like, huh? Yes. Yeah. What of these, you know, if we were hanging out at the time of your diagnosis, the things that you're relaying here, Howard, you know, how surprised would you be by the things you're saying right now? If we met uh, at the moment of diagnosis. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, again, during it, it's it's little things like when I was first diagnosed and I started to lose some of my mobility, you know, what I was doing was putting the band-aids on my illness. Like um, we got a stair chair to, to take me up the stairs into my bedroom because I I would transfer, you know, I would transfer from the wheelchair into the stair chair and still be able to push myself up to get into the walker and then walk to the bed, not realizing that eventually I wouldn't be able to do that anymore. So rather than spend all that time and money on the stair chair, the smart thing might've been to, you know, either build a bedroom downstairs or get an elevator to take me upstairs. But, you know, there's so many things you don't realize you need to do until it's time to do it. And that's, you know, that's been one of my biggest frustrations with the illness is nobody said to me, you know, as much as you want to think you can beat this right now, the possibility exists that this could be your future. And, and I get that, you know, people don't want to do that because they don't want to scare you or make you stop trying. But the reality is, things are going to get worse. And mm -hmm. if, you know, if you're not prepared for it, it can kind of hit you hard. Right on. Well, Howard, I mean, I love talking with you. We could talk forever. Uh, there's some big stuff you're pointing to here. But maybe we should cut over, get the audience going here. Questions or comments? Um, we can open this up a little bit. Sonia, what are we seeing out there? Let's see, just have some um, comments for you, Howard, just a appreciation for your perspective. And then one quick question. I think you mentioned, was it the Criterion channel 
Is that what you were saying you watched? Yes. Okay, perfect. perfect. Cannot recommend it enough. I think BJ is a fan of that one I, too. I agree with you. <laughs> okay, let's see. Okay, we've got a hand up here. One sec. You may, is it Louise? You may need to unmute yourself on your end. Okay, I did that. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Okay. Hi, Howie. Hey, Louise. <laughs> I've known you for many years and I've seen some transitions over that time. I really am learning new things about you from hearing what you're saying. So I appreciate that. You're very articulate about what you're telling us. How are you able to separate yourself, who you are as a person from the disease? You know, it's funny because I, I, I think there, I, in all honesty, I never thought of myself as somebody who had a disease, even to this day. I mean, even sitting here now, not being able to move, talking about the disease, in my mind, I never fully accepted that I had it, which I guess is denial, I don't know. But I mean, I'm aware of all the problems, but I never thought of myself as somebody with a disease. Hmm. Um, and, and I think it's because I've never not been able to do something that I really set my mind out to. I've always been able to find a way to work around it, mm -hmm. um, even though it means doing it in a markedly different way than the way other people would have done it or the way I would have done it 10 or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. it, there's always another way through just about everything. Howard, can I follow up? And Louise, please sure. stick with us and chime back in. I was just going to say, like, so if you don't, if that part of your brain doesn't see yourself, I'm I as Howard with, you know, with a with a disease with MS. What does your brain say? I I'm I'm just Howard making my way through the day, or what does your brain say you are? I I can't use the language, but um, <laughs> you can. I, I've always viewed myself as a tenacious motherfucker <laughs> and somebody who just is not afraid of life, who is not afraid of the consequences of bad mistakes. Um, because I, I, I've always been, or at least I've always tried to just be accountable for the things I say and do. Um, hmm. And just having fun with it always. I mean, you know, for me, it's, it, you know, life has always been, when I was first diagnosed, my initial reaction was, this is a challenge. This is another puzzle for me to figure out. Wow. And even to this day, I think I still look at it like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, the right piece to put in the right spot. You know, what, what I'm coming to realize is sometimes there aren't any pieces that are going to fit. And there's just some stuff I can't do. But that doesn't mean I can't try to do it. Howie, just as a follow-up, you, you don't see yourself as a disease, but when you go out in the world, and I know you've traveled with your wheelchair, et cetera, um, how do other people who don't know you react to you? Do, are they condescending? Are they, you know, do they ignore you? What, what's it like? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, that, and that, thank you. That, that's, <laughs> that's the one thing that, that annoys me. Um, being at a cocktail party, um, and looking at everybody's backside, you know, because I'm in a chair. So when I'm looking at people's backside, I'm literally looking at their butts. Um, so I actually got a wheelchair that will elevate me. So I get eye level with people um, because it used to infuriate me. When, when I'm in a room with people, I tend to feel invisible. Um, and that, that will bring up emotion. Um, I think there's a reluctance for me to be um, in crowds of people if I don't feel like I'm owning the space. Like if people don't know me beforehand and aren't looking at me as, oh, this is Howard Spira, you know, the tenacious guy who can talk about anything. If I'm in a room of strangers, 
I feel invisible and it's harder for me to break through that wall of invisibility because I'm disabled. Um, but I'm trying to figure out ways to do that. Um, and, and traveling, <laughs> you know, I, I just want to give a shout out to Delta Airlines because I saw they finally are looking at um, setting up a seat in an airplane where I can actually drive my wheelchair onto the plane and have it stay on the plane. Because up until now, when I fly, it is the most dehumanizing experience to kind of get lifted up, put in these little strollers where they stroll you down the aisle, bump your shoulders into the chair, drop you on the floor, never get you in the seat properly. It's just... It, and break your wheelchair. Yeah, and break my wheelchair. Um, but, you know, quite frankly, it impacts my willingness to fly sometimes. You know, um, I, I, I'm going to do a humble brag. But I, I took on a death penalty case down in Alabama for this kid who, 21-year-old kids on death row. And rather than flying down to Alabama, I drove down there in my van because I didn't want to deal with the headache of flying. You know, it's, it's unfortunate. But again, it's part of who I am. Rather than not going, I said, I'm going to put aside a week, drive down to Alabama and go visit this, this kid in prison. But yeah, it sucks. Yeah, I've uh, danced with that with my mom and her wheelchair on flights. I'm uh, aware of a good friend of ours, Jessica Juarez, who's litigating a case around airlines ruining the chair. And uh, I mean, this is not enough. This is there's some activism around this very issue you guys are bringing up here. There's a lot to think through. Uh, how much of your time with your legal mind, too, Howard? Do you find yourself as part of, for whatever reason, personally or professionally, do you find yourself looking around the world through the lens of accessibility and wanting to kind of, do you get involved with accessibility or ADA issues one way or another? I toy with that. I mean, right now I, I haven't had the bandwidth for it yet, yeah. but every once in a while, I, I kind of nudge myself to think about, yeah, I've offered myself up to people who want somebody to go in front of legislative bodies, you know, to speak. One of the things that I'm really a proponent of is the whole, you know, right to die notion. Mm. Um, you know, because and, and again, that's what life kind of became easy for me was when I came to understand that I would have the ability to basically decide when it was time for me to check out, you know, because my biggest fear was, you know, being stuck in a bed, not being able to talk, not being able to move, and having to continue to be alive. And it wasn't until I realized that there was a way where I can kind of take ownership of, you know, my time to exit, that I decided, you know, I could be okay with that. Hmm. And I believe it's legal in New Jersey. Uh, in yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You know, and somebody gave me a great, you know, they, they told me I can always choose not to eat. And as soon as I choose not to eat, that kind of changes the game and they have to put me in hospice. Hmm. But again, it's, it's knowing that I have the ability to control that narrative that was just so important to me. Because for me, that was the one thing that, you know, kept me up at night. It's like, what if it gets so bad that I decide I'm done and nobody will take that seriously. And that feels, you feel that question's put to rest, Howard? Yeah, and, and it's funny because once I put it to rest, it kind of gave me the freedom to do anything. Yeah. Because as long as I knew that yeah. if it gets really, really bad, I can close the door, I'm not afraid to try anything anymore. Yeah. Because, you know. Yeah. You've got a, a sense like a sort of a parachute if you need it, you know, I, yep. and you know, on that note, that's, that's a lot of the data around that law, the benefits of, of an aid in dying law and yeah. guys out there, I think there are 11 states now, including the D District of Columbia, maybe wrong there, but 
I believe it's about 11 states who have laws on the books to allow someone living with advanced illness to hasten their own death. That's what we're talking about here, guys. And Jer New Jersey is one of those states. And that's the, you know, a lot of the fears around these laws are that they would lead to just people just jumping off the planet too easily. Um, there's a lot to say about these laws, but one thing that's clear about them is a lot of folks never invoke the law. It is, it's the therapy is just as you're pointing to, Howard, is knowing that you've got a way out if you need it. And that is the, that's the therapy. Yeah, that's the funny thing. Once you realize that you can leave when you want to, that's when you really start living. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can't tell you how, how free I feel knowing that. It's a funny thing that death can do for us, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Louise, was there more you wanted to follow up there with your friend Howard? Or shall we move on to other questions, guys? No, I think that was good. And Howie, I appreciate how articulate you are about these things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Howard, we've got quite a few questions coming in for you. So this person said, my husband is a T11 complete paraplegic from a spinal cord injury in 2007. I have been his only caregiver for the past 15 years. We are having huge communication breakdown. What do you recommend? If you can afford to get a third person in to help with the care. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard because Somebody, Dory and I actually gave a, a speech to um, a hospital that provides home health services. And one of the things we were both adamant about is that too many people worry about the person with the illness and nobody comes in and asks the caregiver, how are they doing? What do they need? Because, you know, as a caregiver, You've got a whole different set of needs and, and issues and who's taking care of you. And it's really important to get a third person in there that, again, it's the perspective thing that can take a step back. And, you know, you take a step back and just look at all this and say, what is it that I'm really not doing for myself right now? Because I'm so concerned about what I need to do for my husband. Because the reality is, you know, it's, there's a reason why they tell you in an airplane, when the airbags come down, put yours on first. Because if you're not taking care of yourself, you're just not gonna be able to be your best for your husband. So give yourself the gift to take care of yourself and be, and be selfish with it. I mean, don't be afraid to be selfish with the self-care. Mm. You know, that's my biggest piece of advice. Mm. Is Dory taking that advice? Not enough. <laughs> and, and she will beat me when we're done for saying that, but not enough. <laughs> this <laughs> next person <laughs> said, can you elaborate on how you came to accept the impact of your disability on others as opposed to accepting that you have a disability? Um, I, I think... It's realizing that the way people react to my disability, it's got nothing to do with me. It, it's their own issues. I can't, I, can't, I can't change the way people feel. I can't affect the, the things it brings up for them. All I can do is be me and not being affected by their emotional you know, gamut of what they run through just allows me to be me. Um, they've got their own journey. I can't control it. I think, you know, BJ, you asked me earlier about the communication with Dory. It's when I stopped trying to manage the way that she was reacting to my illness, that things really started to change. Beautiful. I, we spent the longest time, you know, me tripping over myself because I was trying to manage her reaction to my illness. And, you know, until she became adamant that, I can't do that. And, and you can't. You, you, you can't have any effect on the way other people react to your illness. You know, all I can do is be me. And they're going to, you know, if they choose to hang around with me, that's great. If they choose to walk away, I'm better off for it. 
-hmm. You know, I, I, I don't need people in my life who are going to be uncomfortable being around me. Um, it's one of the things I'm, I'm really striving to about with my caregivers. If they aren't willing to get on the Howie bus, mm -hmm. I, I look for another one. You know, it's just really important to, you know, keep yourself in contact with people who buy into your vibe. You don't owe anything to anybody. Ooh, that's a big statement right there, Howard. Uh, I feel like we should repeat that. We don't owe anything to anybody. I mean, that is... Yeah. I am newly tuned into this feeling of of indebtedness and that we owe each other and taking responsibility for other people's feelings and how in uh, just personal take I, I can get crazy with that and what and what you just said cuts right through it and it doesn't make it easy I mean I'm assuming you've probably shed some tears over folks who couldn't show up or I don't know how, you know you make how, how do you deal with the emotional load of what you just said I move on to the next hmm. one yeah. I mean, I really, I have a very short, very short memory for people mm. who aren't making me happy. Mm. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm incredibly selfish, I think. Mm. You know, um, I've learned to really exercise the selfishness muscle. Mm. You know, not only, you know, don't people owe anything to me, I don't owe anything to anybody. I mean, it's, I can't feel guilty that I got sick. Yeah. You know, it just happened. Yeah. Amen, brother. Amen. And on that note, this next question is, how would you like strangers to interact with you? I would like to know how best to interact with someone I meet in a wheelchair. The way you would react to anybody. I mean, just don't, they're not in a wheelchair. They have to be sitting. And, and the thing they're sitting happens to move. But beyond that, they're just like everybody else in your life. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. To, it's amazing to me that people think that because you're in a wheelchair, somehow you're different. I'm still an asshole. <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, I'm still the same arrogant asshole I was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. I just, now if you want to smack me in the head, it's harder for me to get away from it. <laughs> but that's it. Nothing's changed. Hmm. Well, can I? Uh, no, sorry. And, I, and I think that's the biggest gift you can give people who, you know, are, are disabled. They want to, and that, that's what allows me to not think about the illness mm -hmm. is because I still embrace who I was and I refuse to allow other people to redefine me as somebody who's sick. And I jump in on that hugely important note because it also reflects what you and Louise were talking about, where you said maybe you're in denial that you don't see yourself as a person. I want to make a, I think we're making a really important distinction here. You controlling the narrative or you choosing the words yourself or you choosing the frame in which you see yourself is importantly different from being in denial. Okay. So, and I think that's what you do, Howard, to, for the record just to split that hair a little bit, because I think it's really, really key. Um, and then you just did it again with that answer, that perfect answer. You're the one framing it. You're, you haven't outsourced that perspective. So anyway, that, that to me is not denial. That is, is work in the narrative that serves you, that suits you. Can I just say something to Diane who just posted something? That oh, you yeah. are hopeless. That is the biggest gift in the world. If you feel lost and hopeless, what that means is you no longer have anything to lose. It's as bad as it can get. So just go run at it. What, what, what can be any worse than the way you feel right now? And, you know, again, it goes back to that movie I saw about this, this mother of this child who they said was going to die at 20 and everybody started to deal with them as a walking, you know, a walking corpse until somebody said, if everybody else thinks you're dead, you got nothing to lose by just living the life you want to live. If you feel lost and hopeless, everything is on the table. You can now do anything you want to do, anything. 
and it can't get any worse than the way you feel right now. Yeah, there's something really beautiful about the view from when you're down on your knees, you know, I'm with you. Um, Howard, can I return to, I think one of the things, maybe another answer to that question Sure. that the person was asking about sort of essentially etiquette. Do you like it when someone kneels down to be at eye level with you or look for a chair? Does that, does that, is that a meaningful act? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, I don't think about it, but yeah, yeah. It, when 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 people make an effort to get down at my level, I mean, when people make an effort to come see me, mm -hmm. I mean, I can't tell you how often I tell people, you know, just come see me. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but when people will will, you know, sit or you know make the effort to make things more comfortable for me, it's great. Right on. Good. And do you get hung up or while we're on etiquette, languaging? I mean, I know it's important for some folks to say, you know, person with a disability versus a disabled person, or some people don't like handicap. I mean, just while we're on the etiquette, does it matter to you? Not at all. I, to me, authenticity trumps etiquette. It's, yeah, a, 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 yeah, we, we, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, we probably need to have you back here, Howie. This has been so... Yeah. <laughs> um, We've got a few more questions, but I, the audience seems to agree with that. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, BJ, go ahead. No, I was just going to cut to you, Sons. Any... <laughs> okay, this next question was, um, what's your advice to a wife whose husband is in the stage where they pretend they're okay or simply mostly withdraw since they can't pretend that well anymore? get them in, the, in get them in the company of other people with a disability you, where you're not there and let them talk honestly uh, yeah I, I think there's a game face they put on for you that if they have the ability to be with someone else may not may not show up um I know you know I'm very lucky in that I have a a, a what we call a men's team, a bunch of men who get together with me every other week. And I get to say things to them that I, I am not willing to say to Dory. And I'm not willing to say to other people in my life. Um, and I found that just being able to have it come out of my mouth, you know, provides a world of difference. Because if, if I allow things to just rattle around in my head, it'll make me crazy. But as soon as I articulate it and hear it, you know, I, I, I have the ability to realize whether or not it's bullshit or whether or not it's true. And even if it's true, I get to see the way other people react to it. And, you know, lo and behold, especially if they're talking to other people with a disability, all the stuff they're feeling, they're going to be shocked the year they're not the only one going through it. And that to me is so important to realize that that my situation is not so unique. You know, as much as I like to think I'm the most special person in the world, <laughs> I'm not, I mean, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Okay, let's see, we've had some hands up for a while. Mary, thank you so much for your patience here. You may have to unmute yourself on your end. Hello. Hi, Mary. Hi. Hi. Um, Howard, I'm uh, one limb short of being an MS quadriplegic. Um, I wonder, I need a, a care with every ADL. Um, I wonder what you do um, in a typical day. And also, I kind of miss travel. I feel kind of trapped in my house. And do you have any trips or resources for people like me and you? Where do, where do you live? New Jersey. You, uh, I'm in Jersey. There we go. I got a van. You tell me where you want to go. I got AIDS. It'll take us there. <laughs> awesome. Um, awesome. One of the things I'm looking into is going skydiving. Uh-huh. Um, no, thanks. <laughs> I, well, you can watch me then. Um, but no, it, it's it's really, it's it, it's frustrating because a lot of the things I, I wish were more accessible aren't. 
but you know, I have a van that accommodates me. Um, I'm always looking for, you know, things that I can and can't do. Um, I know they now have um, wheelchairs on the beach that, that actually go on the beach. There's a lot of stuff out there, not enough, but I think the more people ask, the more people realize there's a market for it and they may start looking into, you know, offering things. I don't know if, you, have you ever been to the Abilities Expo? No, no. I, once a year, what, what, my, what my email is going to be out here, right? At some point, DJ. Yeah, yeah, we'll be sending it out. Yeah, because yeah, uh -huh. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, waste everybody's time. I would have a million questions for you. So that, we'll do it later. Yeah, there's an organization that does these abilities expos around the country. And at the expo, there are people who offer all these kind of adventures like water skiing, rock climbing, you know, handicap travel, places that specialize in handicap travel. I mean, they come to New Jersey first week of, of May every year in, in Raritan. That sounds great. Thank you. I, I have another couple million questions for you. We'll do it some other time. Um, like I said, I could talk forever. So yeah, at your own peril. Thanks, Mary. I love it. Okay, Howard, we've got two other questions. Marcy, thank you so much. You've had your hand up for a second here. Hi, Howard. Hi. I'm the one who asked a question, the first question for you, but um, sorry, I'm kind of upset right now, but what if that's not an option? What if I'm the only person that can provide that caregiver role? There isn't anybody else. It's just the two of us. And I also have a disability. So it's, it's very difficult. What do you recommend? I think you'd be surprised at how many people are out there that may want to help. <laughs> I, I don't know where you live. I don't know what your situation is, but you'll never know what's available until you ask. And keep asking. If the people you ask the first time can't help, you got to find another place to ask. It can be a college. It can be, you know, senior services. Um, the more, the more, the, 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 the neurology, just whomever, the, the broader the net, just keep asking. I mean, that that's one of the things that I'm really proud of is I'll just keep asking until I get the answer that I want to work with. Yeah, yeah. I just love this guy. You're going to get a lot of no's. You're going to get a lot of pushback. But just keep asking because the reality is you got nothing to lose by asking. Thank you, sir. Marcy, I want to add to that mix, you know, there are independent living centers. There's a national, we should get the website. Um, I mean, I think part of the answer to here is just exhausting what, what resources exist besides the goodness of others um, and finding what your rights are and what's in your neighborhood and what insurance would cover, et cetera, can be really difficult. You may have already done all of that, but one thing to consider is reaching out to an independent living center. And if you Google your location, independent living center, I bet something would come up. We'll try to find a reference to put in the uh, what we send out here after the talk. Um, but I think that's an important piece too, is exhausting all the resources that you have access to that you might not know about. You may have already done that. Um, but then one, one last comment too on top of Howard's is, yeah, I think that, amen, keep on asking. And if you're saying to us, there's really no one to ask, you may live, depending on where you live, that may be true too. Um, and I think ultimately, this may sound like, I don't know what, but ultimately all of this subject, we're all dealing with a bunch of, a, a list of things, uh, a lot of which we'd rather not deal with. And we wish we, we wish were another way. And it may be on that list that you wish that there was more help around that just isn't. And so I just want to name that that may also be the case. And we can we can grieve that, too. Um, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. See. 
All right, we have one final question here. Thank you, Howard and BJ and everyone for staying over. Um, this person said, could you address defining the differences of living in denial, managing your anger at your circumstances, toxic or overly positive people and interactions, and your open, honest perspective? <laughs> um, the great thing about anger is it usually will motivate you into action. You know, if you think about it, all the other emotions tend not to motivate you to do something. When you get angry, that'll pretty much trigger the ability to kind of act. Um, toxic people, it's easy to, I mean, the great thing about phones is easy. you can block, you can block people from calling you. You know, one of the frustrations I used to have not being able to move was when my wife would piss me off. I, I couldn't, I couldn't get out of the room. You know, so we actually, I addressed it with her. I said, look, you need to appreciate that sometimes when you come in here and you want to talk to me about the things you want to talk to me about, I may not be in the mood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe we need to start with you asking me if now's a good time. Um, there's a, you have to keep on trying things on until they fit. Everybody's different. You know, I, I, I can't tell you what works for me may not work for you. But again, the reality of just, you know, looking at your life is this is horrible is it doesn't hurt to try different things until something works for you. Thank you. This is, by the way, just keep editorializing. What you just said, Howard, is why I love this realization. Like people dealing with illness or disability, all sorts of things that limit limitations are some of the most creative people you'd ever meet for that exact reason, Howard, what you just said. You just keep finding your way. And it's not always how you imagine it's, I don't know about you. I, I can imagine you throw yourself into situations. You can't imagine how you're going to work it through, but you do. You kind of I would say the vast majority of things that go on these days are nowhere near what as I envision. Yeah. yeah. And yet here you are. Yep. Well, sounds have we uh we got to all of them. Thank you so much, Howard. That was a really beautiful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, man. That was awesome. Thank you, Howard. And, and thank you, Dory. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bye. everyone, so much for being here and wishing everyone a good weekend. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for Penny for behaving yourself. <laughs>